my name is Eric Emile. I'm going to present you a work on optimizing multi-method dispatch using compressed dispatch tables. This is a work I've done with uh, Oliver Gruber and Eric Simon at INRIA, France. So what the first question is, what are multi-methods? As you may know, in traditional object-oriented programming, method dispatch is based on the runtime type of a single distinguished argument called the receiver. But in the case of multi-methods, method dispatch is based on the runtime types of all arguments. If we look at an example schema, we see a type hierarchy with 10 types and a generic function, that, that's what they, they call them with multi-methods, with five different methods implementing uh, this generic function m. They are named m1 to m5 and correspond to five different combinations of types. The goal of this research is to find an efficient implementation of multi-method dispatch that offers constant time performance. This is a very important property for performance-oriented people. And this excludes any caching approach that have been proved to be uh, efficient, uh, but that don't offer constant time performance. The basic idea is that we know there is a dispatch technique called dispatch tables that work for mono methods and that meet the requirements of constant time performance. So the question is, is it possible to use dispatch tables for multi-methods? And the answer is yes. Here you have the dispatch table of generic function m. It's a two-dimensional array, one, one dimensional for each argument. It is indexed by the types of the type hierarchy. And it works like that. If you want to find the method corresponding to a certain invocation, like m invoked with uh, two arguments of type e and d, you look at the row of e, the first argument, and the column of d, second argument. And at the intersection, you have a pointer to the corresponding method. In this case, it's m5. So how do we use such dispatch table to dispatch a method invocation? Let's assume that each type in a hierarchy owns a unique index stored in every object of that type. Then if we have an invocation m with arguments o1 to on, we translate it into the following code. First, we get the index of the type of each argument. And using these indices, we retrieve the pointer to the method at that position in the dispatch table. And then, using this pointer, we invoke, we call the method with the arguments O1, ON. So where is the catch? Where is the problem? Well, it's easy to see that in the type hierarchy of K types, the dispatch table of an n generic function is an n-dimensional array with k rows in each dimension. So the size of the table is k to the power of n. And this means that we have a space problem, because k is usually several hundred types, and n varies between 2 and 4. So the solution that we propose is based on the following observation. If we go back to the dispatch table that we just saw, we see that there are certain rows and columns, like uh, p, that only contain null values. This means that there is no applicable method when such a type appears at such argument position. And moreover, there are certain rows and columns that are identical, like rows A, C, and F. So what we propose is to compress the dispatch table. And 
eliminate uh, rows and columns that only contain null values and group rows and columns that contain identical values. So here is, you, here you see the compressed version of the dispatch table. We see that we, uh, you see that we have grouped types A, C, and F, rows to A, C, and F, B and I, D, G, and H, and in the second dimension, columns B, E, and I, etc. So you can read it like that. If the first argument is of type, is either of type B, E, and I, and the second argument is either of type D, G, and H, then the corresponding method is M5. So we, we end up now with a compressed dispatch table that contains only nine elements instead of the hundred in the original table. But there is a space-time trade-off, of course, and there is an overhead caused by compression. Why? Because types cannot have a unique index anymore. For example, if you look at the compressed dispatch table, you see that now B is in second row, but in first column. So there must be a way to map types to their position in each dimension of the dispatch table of each generic function. So how do we do that? Well, for each n generic function, we use n arrays of k elements to hold the position of each type in each dimension. So here, for example, you have the two arrays for generic function m. And you see that for b, for instance, the first array contains the position of b in the first dimension, which is 2. And the position of B in the second dimension, which is 1. Now, how do we use these arrays and the compressed dispatch table to perform method dispatch? So if we have an invocation M with arguments O1 to OM, we now translate it in the f into the following code. We use first the global index of the type of each argument. And we use it to retrieve the position of that type in that dimension of the compressed dispatch table. And then when we have the position of the type in that dimension, we use this index to get the, the method pointer from the compressed dispatch table. And then we call, finally, we call the, the corresponding method. So we see that there is an overhead of n one-dimensional array accesses. This is a price to pay in time for compression. Now the question is, how do we compress the dispatch table? The naive approach would be to scan the table and look for null or identical rows and columns. Well, that wouldn't be a good solution because the the time of such a scan would be in the order of k to the power of n plus 1, which is enormous if, for instance, you have a two-argument method in a type hierarchy of 500 types. This would yield 125 million of operations just to, to compress the dispatch table of one generic function. So the solution we propose is based on the following observation. If you look at the compressed dispatch table, you see that in every group indexing the compressed dispatch table, there is a type which is a supertype of all the other types of the group. For example, you see in the first dimension, A is a supertype of C and F, 
B is a supertype of E and I, and D is a supertype of G and H. We call such types poles. And for each dimension, for each argument position, there is a different set of poles, and we call them I poles, with I being the argument position. So we have one poles, and we have two poles. Here you, you see the I poles, the one poles and the two poles, on the type hierarchy, and with the types, the, the subtypes, they group. We call the subtypes they group their I influence. So for instance, for the first dimension, you see A, B, and D are the, the, I po the, the one poles, and C and F is the one influence of A, G, uh, G and H is the, I, the, the one influence of D, and E and I is the one influence of B. So the question is now, compressing the dispatch table amounts to finding these one and two poles and their one and two influences. So how do we find the I, the I poles? Well, at position I, this is the formal definition. The, the I poles are the smallest set of types containing all the types that appear as argument as position I and without any multiple inheritance conflict. So if we look at our example, we see that in the first argument position, we have types A and B that appear as formal arguments. So these are the first two uh, one poles. Now, intuitively, this means that the polymorphism will make C and F, for instance, subtypes of A, behave like A with respect to method dispatch. So th this is why A is called a pole, because it influences its subtypes because of polymorphism. Now, what is the, 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 the reason for the second uh, condition, the multiple inheritance conflict? Well, if you look at D, you see that it is a subtype of both A and B, which are two poles. So here you have a multiple inheritance ambiguity. So the consequence is you cannot decide whether D behaves like an A or like a B. So you have to make D a pole itself with its own influence. This is for the I poles. Now, how do we compute the I influence of an I pole? Well, formally, the I influence of an I pole T is the set of its subtypes that are not subtypes of any other pole U subtype of T. So basically, what you do is you start with an I pole, you go down the type hierarchy, collecting types, subtypes, and you stop in a certain path as soon as you've encountered an I-pole. Well, now, how do we relate these I-poles and this, these I-influences to the compressed dispatch table? Well, the types that are not part of any I-influence can be eliminated from the I-dimension of the dispatch table and types that belong to the same I influence can be grouped in the I dimension of, this, of the dispatch table. The second result is that finding the I poles and their I influences can be achieved in the order of 1 plus C squared times K, where C is the maximum number of direct supertypes in the hierarchy. And this is typically between three and four. So the central result is that we can perform compression in, in time linear uh, with respect to k instead of in the order of k to the power of n plus one. Now, how, how do we evaluate the performance of our algorithm? Well, first of all, the size of the compressed dispatch table is the product 
of the number of eyepoles at each dimension. And obviously the number of eyepoles at position E i is much smaller than the number of types k. Why? Because usually a generic function is defined only in a, in a subpart of the type hierarchy, not over the whole type hierarchy. So it is only a fraction of the number of times. This is why compression is rapidly very effective. And moreover, the bigger the arity n or the number of types k, the more effective compression is. Now for the bad news, the compression algorithm is not always optimal. Here you have a case where after the table is compressed, where there are still two columns that are identical. And moreover, there are pathological cases where compression is totally ineffective. And this is the case with, with generic function that are defined over the whole type hierarchy for every type. For example, uh, an equality uh, generic function that would be defined for every pair of type like a, A, B, B, C, C, etc. To conclude, we see that the compression algorithm is simple, very effective, independent of any particular method precedence order that are used to solve multiple inheritance or multi-targeting ambiguities, and that the algorithm is applicable to statically or dynamically types languages. The last word, in order to evaluate uh, our algorithm, we are looking for programs with multi-methods. So if anybody out there has actual core code or specifications, we'd really will welcome them. Thank you very much.